Greetings and welcome to In-Depth. I'm DK Rasta. The Emancipation Support Committee hosts the Kwame Ture Lecture Series as a forerunner to Emancipation Day Observances. The three lectures, they run for eight weeks leading up to emancipation. Now we are going in-depth on one of those lectures, Decolonizing Data and Democratizing Artificial Intelligence. For that, we are joined by criminologist, criminal psychologist, AI ethicist and strategist, data activist and urban technologist, Renee Cummings. Thank you so much for joining us, Renee. I want to start off asking about the premise of this lecture, please. Well, I think uh, this lecture is to celebrate uh, the spirit and the power of Kwame Ture and what he did for radical thinking and African liberation and, and equity and, and social justice and, and civil rights. So I think uh, my lecture falls neatly into that because it deals with justice, equity, inclusion and diversity all the things that are critical to our radical thinking and, and just that uh, really radical spirit. But how do we start to set up a, a framework or a rubric to go about these in achieving these incremental steps towards progress as opposed to possibly grasping at straws and you know goalposts, they may tend to shift. So how do we start to set up that framework? Well, I think we set it up by broadening our thinking, our perspective, our understanding, and really heightening our intellectual uh, curiosity. So the reason that I chose this topic for the lecture, to decolonize data and to mock, democratize AI, because data is power. Who owns the data owns the world. We are seeing the extraordinary potential of data to transform. Uh, to heighten knowledge, to bring precision thinking and precision decision making to, to progress and, and the ways in which we're interacting and, and engaging with each other and the ways in which we are developing as a society. But in that spirit of Kwame Ture, what we're realizing is the lack of equity in our data and uh, the need for critical thinking around data. So decolonizing data really speaks to the fact that the ways in which we have historically and presently been collecting data is really a form of colonization or a form of colonialism. So decolonizing is a restorative justice movement that seeks to address the ongoing influence of colonial legacies and how we collect, analyze, represent present, present, and visualize data. So it's really critical for us to imagine, examine, and reimagine the ways that we are doing data, particularly because of those colonial power structures that continue to produce inequalities today in the ways in which we are using data for the advancement of society. And I really appreciate that reimagining aspect of it. And it reminds me of uh, Professor Rex Nettleford and Edna Manley looking to reach inward, to inward stretch, outward reach. But if we're looking at reimagining, what do we start to do? Where do we start to do it from? What's the kind of data that we need to be creating and curating in-house, as it were, as opposed to being more consumers of? Right. So what we need to understand is that We've got to democratize the ways in which we are thinking about data because data is being used to create this thing called an algorithm. And an algorithm is probably the most powerful instrument of this uh, century and of, of future centuries uh, that we are going to see. So if we are to democratize data science and democratize artificial intelligence, we've got to come with a justice-oriented trauma-informed and people-powered perspective. Uh, so data has been has to be used for uh, the public good and, and AI has got to be used for, for social good. You see, this is the thing. We are creating data and our data is creating these profiles about us. Every time you click, every time you share, every time you speak, every time you uh, ponder or look at an image or, or share an image, every sentiment that you share on social media or in cyberspace or in the, the metaverse is collected and it is 
monetized and it is often weaponized against us. So it is really important for us to think about how big technology companies, those are what we call the big tech hegemony, the kind of leadership and the kind of dominance that they have and the fact that we're seeing a whole other interpretation of colonialism that's creating this major gap between what they call the global north and the global south and particularly Caribbean countries, small nations have got to really start thinking about data and uh, digital transformation and thinking about doing uh, digital transformation ethically and responsibly and creating digital tools that respect uh, society and, and communities and, and really embraces a kind of thinking that not only stretches the imagination, but a thinking that ensures that human rights and, and civil rights and, and civil liberties are, are lifted up instead of what we are seeing at the moment when it comes to Black, Indigenous, people of color and how we're being represented in data sets or not represented in data sets. And do you make a distinction between data and content? And because you spoke about clicks, what it is you like, what it is you stay on and look at. So, um, and so I mean, so many persons that they're creating reels, videos, taking selfies, taking part in 10-year challenges, etc. Is there a difference between data and content or how does one dovetail into the other? Well, sure. Our data is definitely content because content and data combine to create information. And that information is trans posed and transformed into knowledge. And that knowledge is what creates insight and the ability to forecast and predictive power and precision decision making and profits. So data is ownership. So who owns the data owns the world. And at the moment, we are all owned by five big companies and they call those the uh, GAFAM. And it's uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple and Microsoft. These companies are directing the world because of their leadership and dominance and the amount of money they have made from us, from the things that we have shared, the things that we like, the sentiments that we have expressed in the social media space. And all of those companies actually have, uh, you know, when you think about it, an extraordinary amount of power. They can challenge governments and they challenge governments. When you think about the, the relationship or the, the case of Facebook versus Australia, when Facebook wanted Australia to change its media laws and Australia decided it didn't want to do that. And then Facebook denied them having their Australian news uh, channels from Facebook. And that put a lot of pressure on the Australian government to really buckle to the pressures of Facebook. So we've got to think about it. And small nations like Trinidad and Tobago, we're not even in the data game as yet, but yet all our data is already owned. So everything we are thinking and feeling and doing and the things that we want to do, uh, even a, you know, just from a developmental perspective as a country is already owned by someone else. And that is something that I want to start to well, our conversation with when we re return from this break. We're speaking with Renee Cummings. We're looking at democratizing data as well as uh, de well, decolonizing data and democratizing artificial intelligence. Stay with us. We'll return with more. Welcome back. We are speaking with Renee Cummings, a data activist, artificial intelligence ethicist, among many other things. Now, you just spoke about if we are going to get more into data for development, Renee. How do we start to do some of these things with this justice-oriented and trauma-informed ethos that you would have mentioned a little earlier? And why is it important? Take me through the process of saying, okay, well, this is important because of this. Definitely. So when we think about AI, artificial intelligence, we're all using it. Uh, we're using it at the moment, how we're communicating you and I, if you use any social media platform, if you use any uh, uh, anything on the internet, 
if you do any kind of online shopping, if you ever used Google to search for anything, you have used artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is really uh, simply creating a code using math that creates a code and that code gives the computer a particular instruction. And that code is called an algorithm. And what we're seeing with algorithms, because algorithms are built using data. So if you're using data that discriminates, if you're using data that's reproducing and reinforcing colonial structures of inequality, what you are going to get would be the underrepresentation of black, brown, indigenous people of color in those data sets. So we've realized that data discriminates because underrepresented high needs, minoritized groups and communities are usually left out and not accurately represented in mainstream data sets. So what we are seeing is that our data-driven futures are now denying big chunks of the population, you know? our underserved, high needs, minoritized, uh, marginalized groups, an opportunity to really explore what I call their data-driven futures. So we're seeing the discriminatory data undermining legacies. And it's important because one of the things that we want to do as individuals and communities and countries would be create extraordinary legacies, legacies of progress, legacies of opportunity, legacies of, of access. And if, if data is deferring a dream, then what we are seeing at the moment is that many groups are not getting a fair chance because of this colonial approach approach to the ways in which data is analyzed, in the ways in which it is represented, and in the ways in which we collect it. So when we think about development, we have got to think about how are we getting this data? Why are we getting this data? What are we going to do with this data? How are we going to analyze it? And are we going to leave that analysis and that interpretation of our data up to the you know, whims and fancy of, of Western uh, democracies or of uh, Eurocentric interpretations. So that is why it is so important for us to get diversity in the data science and tech and STEM and artificial intelligence space. That is why it is so important to encourage black and brown children to start to engage with coding and AI and deep learning and machine learning and these new technologies that are designing our future. So this is why this lecture is so important because I want to bring this knowledge and this consciousness and this understanding for us and for nationals to get involved in the conversation and to really start to understand the power of data and how important data is for democracy and, and due process and, and decision-making and why we need to bring that ethical vigilance and ethical due diligence to the ways in which we are thinking about digital transformation or, or using data to advance our society. While we are working towards bringing this younger generation along to engage with the, the processes a little more, is it a matter of being more selective in what it is we're doing with, with, that, with that group, that Gap M group, or is it un, un working within that trying to reform a little bit, or is it more prudent to try to separate a little bit? find something else, see who else is, do. No, how, 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 do we, how do we navigate? No, I think what we've got to do is we have got to excite the imagination of our society. And one of the things that we're not seeing a lot in particular in Trinidad and Tobago is that excitement of the imagination. We're not seeing that intellectual curiosity. We're not seeing us wanting to engage with broader concepts to develop our society. We've taken a very local approach to thinking that needs to be innovative, that needs to be more critical, and that needs to be more creative and more imaginative. So what we have got to do is bring these concepts into the classroom, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And we've also got to encourage the collaboration because what we are seeing in data science internationally 
is the need for collaborative and interdisciplinary thinking. So I'm a criminologist, I'm also an AI ethicist, and I'm a data activist. It is the examination of homicide data and predictive policing and intelligence-led policing and, and training individuals in predictive analytics in policing that led me into data science. Because as I started to realize that what we were doing in policing was just totally against the grain because we kept deploying resources in already over-policed communities looking for different kinds of results. So police data is probably one of the most, uh, you know, sort of suspect data collected internationally. And, and it is that, it is my curiosity about making police data more accurate that made me realize that not only police data, but the risk assessment tools that we were designing for sentencing and for parole in the criminal justice system, again, plagued with uh, systemic racism and, and structural oppression. And then we are trying to use these data sets to, to, to administer justice. So what it made me realize is that I had to say something as a criminologist, and I started to speak up about the data sets that were being used in the United States and how these data sets were discriminating and undermining due process and, and the, uh, the, 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 the black box of, of, of the algorithm, you know, the inability to see inside of it and to see how this code was working and, and concepts such as, you know, accountability and transparency and explainability and auditing algorithms, you know, a lot of these are big concepts for our local audience because we are not there yet. But internationally, these are the conversations that are happening. And we as a society have got to get into those conversations in real time. And I'm really glad we're having this one. And I, I feel like you're mashing up plenty of people, Dolly House. But at the same time, Baba Kwame would talk about uh, being ready for the revolution when answering his phone. But in the one and a half minutes we have, if you said we're not ready for, we're not quite there yet, what are some of those, I want to say low-hanging fruits, things that we start to address at this point that we can do at this point? So we have got to have conversations about data. We have got to have conversations about the power and the promise of data. Data has the potential to transform society in real time, in ways in which uh, we can uh, really gain extraordinary momentum and do some extraordinarily positive things to enhance society and of course lift up communities. But where there are rewards, there are risks. So we've got to be cognizant of those risks and we've got to be able to detect and to mitigate and to manage and to monitor those risks. So we've been speaking about digital transformation, but it's not something we're seeing as a society. So if you want to create a kind of behavior, which is a digital kind of identity and a digital kind of behavior, you have got to start to have national conversations about data, about the promise and about the peril. And you've also got to bring that critical understanding, that ethical understanding of what it means to build responsible tech artifacts and tools, what it is to have inclusive innovation, what it is to build trustworthy AI. So it's conversations that need to be had. I felt that the Emancipation Support uh, Committee, the uh, Kwame Ture Lecture, would be a great place to have this conversation. Although all of my work in data science and artificial intelligence is in the US and of course in Europe and, and in Africa, uh, I just wanted to share this conversation with my own people because I think it is so important to share that knowledge. And it's so important to ensure that we are part of, of that conversation because we, you know, we, we're using data and our data is part of the larger global data set. And I think it's, it's good for people to start to understand uh, new and emerging technologies such as AI and virtual reality and augmented reality and how these technologies are not transforming only our lives and our work, but the ways in which we engage, the ways in which we communicate and just the ways in which uh, we are able to build those legacies that we deserve. And speaking of legacies, um, um, apparently I'm supposed to be saying happy belated birthday. So we want to thank you for sharing time. Well, thank you with for that. Thank you so in much. In terms of being, I mean, and you you said Rene Cummings that there is no greater honor than sharing your knowledge. So we thank you for fattening up. We had a little bit with a great deal of food for thought. 
and we want to echo your your sentiments in terms of encouraging individuals to tune into the Emancipation Support Committee's platforms on a Sunday, 24th July at 4 p.m. I believe. And this has been in depth with me, DK Roster. Thank you so much for joining us.